Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming uh, uh, this morning for the budget consultation. This will be the, the second last one that will be held in uh, Fiji for the 2022-2023 elections, as you know, uh, consultation, sorry, budget. Uh, as you know that we've been uh, going around Fiji and meeting with members of the public uh, in respect of telling them what the state of the economy is currently, uh, what are some of the challenges that we have and indeed some of the opportunities. And uh, we've been, uh, we were in Vanu Levu uh, last week in a couple of remote places and also then in uh, Savu Savu and Lambasa. Uh, we've also been in Nandi, Notoka. Uh, we'll be in Ra on Wednesday morning, which will be the last one. And uh, tonight we are in... Uh, in the Sinu Nakasi area. Normally, just do a quick presentation to you in respect of where we are, as I said, with the economy, and then also open up the floor for any questions or queries you may have uh, regarding the budget itself. We have some staff at the back. Uh, sometimes we have people who bring their personal issues, whether it's land issues or personal matters. Uh, please uh, feel free to go to them, to talk to them at the back once we've done the presentation, um, because. Uh, I know sometimes people feel a bit embarrassed to raise their own personal issues in front of everybody, so you can do that at the back. But please feel free to ask any question, any issues you want to raise generally uh, about the economy or the budget, if you want to make any contributions. I'll also at the end of it show you uh, the uh, email address of, um, of the Ministry of Economy where you can actually you know, have any ideas, you want to make any submissions, you can, you can do so uh, after the consultation, but please do, do so by the, in the next couple of days. Okay, as you can see over here, uh, the Fijian economy had been growing, uh, in fact, for the past nine years. And as a result of the, of the pandemic, our economy contracted. In other words, the economy became smaller. As you know that, uh, you know, we had lockdowns, the country was shut down. Basically, all the countries in the world were shut down. And the economies all over the world contracted. And Fiji, of course, was no exception. Um, we had uh, a contraction of about 17.2%. You can see it became much smaller. We lost 4.1% the following year, which was last year. Over 100,000 Fijians uh, lost their jobs or started working part-time or uh, reduced hours, in fact about 120,000 of them. We lost about $4.6 billion in, in GDP as you can see over here. We also lost $4 billion in foreign exchange. Foreign exchange as you know is something that you require foreign currency to be able to trade. Nearly everything we have in Fiji is imported. All the clothes you're wearing on your backs, maybe some of them are sewn here, but the fabric comes from overseas. This mic I'm holding comes from overseas. All the cars outside comes from overseas. The tiles that I'm walking on comes from overseas. The lights come from overseas. All the cameras that these media people are using comes from overseas. A lot of the food items you eat comes from overseas. Now, when we trade, to put simply, they don't require Fijian dollars. You need Japanese yen, you need US dollars, you need Australian dollars, you need New Zealand dollars, whatever the case may be, or euros. So you need foreign currency to be able to trade. Tourists bring in foreign currency. They come from different parts of the world, they bring in foreign currency. When Fiji Airways sells tickets in different parts of the world and bring the money back, we bring foreign currency. We lost $4 billion because there's no longer tourism earnings in the past two years. Government revenue halved by 50%. 50% gone overnight. So less money to deal with, less money to do things with. So you, of course, have to borrow a bit more if you want to carry on with certain projects, etc. You can see how we compare with other countries that were hit by the pandemic. Countries like uh, Mauritius and Maldives, you know, the economy contracted by 33%. Other tourism-based countries, they all also contracted too. So we weren't obviously alone. But we lost about $2.8 billion in tax revenue. You can see how we've been growing uh, for the uh, nine years prior to the pandemic. And the pandemic over here, massive contraction of 17.2%. 4.1% last year, 
we are now expected to grow this year by 12.4%. Obviously, it's a higher percentage because we're starting off at a lower base. If something becomes smaller and then you grow, of course, it will be seen as a big growth. It does not necessarily mean that we're getting back the same level of tourists or same number of tourists. There's still smaller numbers than what it was before. But we're going, going to grow by 12.4%. The reason why we've been able to do that, of course, is because over 90% of the population has been vaccinated. And vaccination is not only about you being safe, your family members being safe, your town being safe, your community being safe, but it's also how other people view you. So when Australians are deciding to go on a holiday, if they see a country with a low rate of vaccination, they won't go there because they won't feel safe. They see a country with a high rate of vaccination, they'll feel safe to go to that country. So even though we had about three, 4,000 cases in the earlier part of last year, because we had a no jab, no job policy, if you want to get the 360, you have to get a jab. You have to be vaccinated. As a result of that, Fiji became one of the most fastest and higher rated uh, vaccinated countries in the developing world. By December of last year, we were able to open up our borders. Now, the great thing is, those of you who have been vaccinated, none of you have paid a single cent for it. As a government, we have not paid a single cent for it. Of course, we pay the nurses to go on a horseback or boat or go by bus or by car to vaccinate people, but the actual vaccine has not cost any one of you a single cent. Why was that? Because as soon as the word vaccine was mentioned, we immediately started our diplomatic efforts, the PM, I told you all that uh, our development partners, India, USA, Australia, New Zealand, etc. We started talking to the World Bank, IMF, because we knew that if you don't put your best foot forward in the first up, first instance, you'll miss out. USA has a population of what, nearly 300 million people. So if there's a vaccine, USA would go to the pharmaceutical company, two doses, said, I'm going to place an order for 600 million doses. Fiji goes along, not even 1 million people, 900,000 people. Fiji will say, I want 1.8 million doses. Who will get the order first, the 600 million order or the 1.8 million? Obviously, the larger countries will get the orders. So this, uh, because of the efforts, the Indians gave us initially 100,000 doses, then the Australians and the Kiwis, the Americans, and now you can see some of the French are giving. So we've been able to open the borders. So you can see over here, Last year, we had only 37,000 tourists. We had nearly 900,000 in 2019. It dropped from there to 147, then down to 32. We're expecting about 490 or 1,000 this year, God willing, by the end of this year. So you can see the growth. That's why you've got that 12.4%. Where are these tourists coming from? Mainly from Australia. The number of Australians we've got in the month of May essentially is about 90% of what we had in 2019. So coming very close to the number of Australians that came in 2019. New Zealand is our next. And then of course we've got the Americans and others who are coming along. June and July bookings are looking very good. And as I said, we, we expect it to grow by 12.4% and then by 9.2% you know, uh, the following year and then 5% in 2024. Everybody's talking about the price of things. Price of things are going up. There's no doubt about that. There's no denying that price of things are going up. Is the price of things, what do you measure? The price of things called inflation, up and down. There are two types of inflation. One is domestic inflation, and the other one is imported inflation. So domestic inflation, let me give you an example of that. Before Cyclone Winston, Yungona was $85 a kilo. After Winston, $185 a kilo in Suva. Why? Because all the Yungona plants got damaged, the plantations. So high demand, low supply. Long beans in the Sori market is what, $2 a bundle? After Cyclone, $5, $7 in sometimes, because supply demand issue. A bunch of bananas before Winston was about two, three dollars. After Winston was about seven dollars. All the banana trees have fallen down. So as a result of the pandemic, the two major things that happened, one of them, the cost of freight went up because
countries like China, which is the largest manufacturer in the world, was actually still in shutdown. Even some parts of China is still shut down until only very recently. They've got bulk of the containers. There's less containers available. The cost of a container before the pandemic from New Zealand to Fiji was about five and a half thousand dollars. After the pandemic, sixteen and a half thousand dollars. That's the cost of freight gone up. If this lady here is uh, importing something from New Zealand, she says she's importing tin fish. If it works out that it, her cost is five dollars for the tin fish, she sells it. She, she will sell it to you. Say it's seven dollars. She makes a margin. But if tomorrow the cost of freight and the price of tin fish goes up and lands in Fiji at seven dollars, she's not going to sell it to you at seven dollars. She'll increase her price. You have to pass on the cost. That's what happens. So the containers were less in supply, high demand for it, so cost of freight has gone up. The second issue is what you call supply-demand issue. The supply-demand issue is that, uh, in terms of supply chains, I should say. So if you see this mobile phone, for this mobile phone to operate, you have what you call a chip, microchip in it that makes it work, this computer. Now, the microchip is made out of a particular metal. Of course, there's some electronics to it, but it's a particular metal. That metal is dug up from the ground. It's, what you, it's mined. If the borders are shut down, there's no mining taking place, there's less supply of that metal. But still, people want mobile phones. The raw material is not available. So there's a shortage of, there's an article, actually, many articles written internationally, where you will see that they talked about the short supply of microchips and how it's going to stabilize very soon. The same way we talk to the shipping companies. What they're telling us is that, hopefully, God willing, by September, October, the freight, the freight cost should start coming down uh, because a lot more containers will be available. Now, we have the Russia-Ukraine war, of course, that's added to what you call fuel to the fire. Russia is the third largest producer of oil, fuel. Now there's a trade ban on Russia. Europe is saying don't trade with Russia. USA is saying don't trade with Russia. You have to punish them for invading Ukraine. There's a direct gas pipeline from Russia to Germany on the land, which supplies cooking gas. We have gas there. Now that's stopped. Less supply of gas, more demand. People still need to cook. People still need gas for other purposes. Um, Ukraine, of course, feeds about 400 million people in the world. They produce large amounts of wheat. All of you eat roti, purini, bambakao, palikeke, bread, scone, all of that is made from flour. Now, there's only two companies in Fiji that make flour, Punja and Sons in Nobutu in Latoka, FMF in Walube in Suva. They import all the wheat from Australia. So they bring it to Fiji, they grind the wheat, they put some vitamins and you get flour. But before they sell it to the supermarkets, because you can't buy it directly from them, unless you're going to retail, before they sell it to the supermarkets, they'll go to the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission because it's a price control item. They'll say, look, we bought this wheat, say, for example, at $300 a ton. This is my labor cost, my electricity cost, my storage cost. And FCCC will look, look at all of that, look at the books, and say, okay, you can make only this much margin. That's what you call wholesale price. Whole place, wholesale price control. Then they sell it to the supermarket. So Shop and Save over here will say, look, this is my cost. I'm renting a building in Nosori. This is my labor cost, electricity cost, all of that. They'll say, okay, you can make only this much margin before you sell it to the public. That's what you call wholesale price control and retail price control. Of course, if tomorrow Australia puts up the price of wheat from $300 to $400 a ton, the price of flour will go up. Same way this lady is bringing the tin fish. The price will go up. She'll pass it on to the consumers. So, Russia Ukraine war had a huge impact on that. Even things like fertilizer. Even before the Russia Ukraine war, the cost of fertilizer jumped. The sugar, we give uh, sugarcane farmers, the uh, cost was $45.65 before the pandemic, a bag of fertilizer. Farmer pays $20, government subsidized $25.65. Before Russia Ukraine war, the price of fertilizer went up to $80. So government has to pay $60, the farmer pays $20. Now, as most people realize, the things like urea and potassium that goes into the fertilizer is made in you know, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine. Now, of course, the price will go up also for that. The World Food Organization measures meat, the price of food, cereal, vegetable oils, etc. And they've 
of course, they're monitoring it. Over here, you can see the red line here. That's what we call the imported inflation, and the green one is domestic inflation. Sometimes, of course, imported inflation can have an impact on domestic items too. I'm a farmer. Assuming that I'm putting fertilizer, and my long beans cost $2, but if my fertilizer cost will go up, my input cost will go up, obviously I pass that cost on to the final price. If I'm, going to sell, if I'm going to go and pick up vegetables, I'm a middleman, and I'm going to pick up vegetables from Singatoga Valley in my truck, and now the cost of fuel has jumped up by one dollar a liter, I'm going to pass that cost on to the vegetable that's going to be sold. So that's why things like fuel has an enormous impact in respect of things like cutters, freight costs, etc. I want to show you uh, a video uh, just to explain to you what, what's happening. This is a video of, uh, from uh, a World Economic Forum that talks about the impact of the war uh, in, in, uh, on, on food prices, etc. <laughs> They were buying the packet 140. For now it is 180. The salad we used to buy around 180 per liter, but for now 300 shillings it's really tough for us. Ukraine grows enough food to feed 400 million people on planet Earth. So, when the farmers on the battlefields aren't planting or aren't harvesting, what impact do you think that's going to have? got a catastrophe knocking and looming on the door for the fall uh, that will be not a price issue but a supply issue availability of food for people around the world and that will be a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe You can see from that that uh, the impact of the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine or the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, it has a huge impact on food supply. As you would have recently heard that uh, uh, Turkey is trying to negotiate with Russia and Ukraine to try and get the wheat out of uh, through, through that access to the sea that goes into the Mediterranean. There's a number of issues of course that has an impact. So. You know, as I mentioned about gas, Qatar is still extracting gas in other countries. Australia has huge amounts of gas. In fact, in Australia, there's a huge debate. In certain states in Australia, they have a shortage of gas, so the price of gas has gone up, even though they're extracting so much gas because they have contracts to supply overseas. And they see a lot of profits gained from selling the gas at a very high price. But the domestic con uh, rates have gone up. Some states in Australia, like Western Australia, already had contracts in which certain percentage of the gas that's extracted from the ground must stay domestically. So they're okay. But other states don't, ha don't have the same kind of luxury. So huge uh, instability as far as pricing is concerned. Nobody knows about fuel. Uh, we understand that Biden is going to uh, Saudi Arabia next week or so to talk to the Saudis to uh, produce more oil. Uh, you know, uh, USA has the largest oil reserves. It's keeping it. They don't want to release it. They want to probably be the last country to be holding all the oil reserves. But you know, there's all these sort of dynamics at play at the moment to see, and we are simply spectators in all of this. We have absolutely no control. It would be great if Fiji had oil. We wouldn't be 
suffering those kind of consequences. But that's, that's what's happening. And the other point that I also wanted to make was uh, a lot of people don't understand that when the, when the pandemic took place, we knew precisely what would be one of the key issues when the border shut down. Our foreign reserves would start dwindling, in other words, becoming less. So what measures did we put in place to ensure that our foreign reserves remained high? Normally when we, uh, when we borrow, uh, all governments in the world borrow, but when we normally borrow, most of our borrowing is from Fijian sources. In other words, we borrow from uh, banks, insurance companies, FNPF. They like to borrow because they make a lot of money from it too. But, and we have about 30 to, you know, 30 percent or so, we borrow from offshore, plus or minus 5 percent. This time around when we borrowed, we borrowed more from overseas. When we borrowed more from overseas, it meant new money came in. When new money comes in, it leads to more cash being in the system, but also more foreign currency. So that gives you stability in your foreign currency. We gain foreign currency not only through tourists, but also when we export things. So last year we exported a lot of vegetables, yongona, turmeric, ginger. That brings in foreign currency also for us. Of course, when we are Fijians living offshore, they send in money, we're getting foreign currency that comes into the system also. So it's the management of that economy during that particular period is critically important and foreign reserves obviously is very, very important. The next video I'm going to show you is actually from Sri Lanka where they have a huge problem with foreign currency. As it is, they had some problems even before the pandemic, but that kind of just really stifled them. And it has led to huge escalation in prices. They had some uh, funny issues. One of the ministers before the pandemic decided to overnight ban a lot of fertilizers, and which meant the yield of the uh, fruits and vegetables came down. So less food was produced. And then, of course, the pandemic came along. When they have less food produced, that means they have to import more. So when they started importing more, it became very difficult because a lot of the foreign currency went out and suddenly they could not afford things. So they can't even afford to buy things like fuel and medicine because they don't have any more foreign currency. So it led to huge uh, you know, impact on people's day-to-day -day living. So something that may have cost $4 today will probably cost $20 in a few weeks' time. And that's what happened. So a lot of people, in fact, felt into uh, destitution. A lot of poverty rates have increased. But I'll, I'll just play that video for you. You can just have that, please. Helping put food on the table, community kitchens like this are starting up around Sri Lanka as people struggle with its worst economic crisis in more than 70 years. Food inflation has hit nearly 60% and many people are finding it difficult to cope. Most of these community who are coming today or been coming are surviving with two meals. So we are giving them the responsibility of surviving for one meal and we are saying, right, we will support you with one meal, but a good healthy meal. Few now get to eat this well. It's very difficult. We rarely get food like this. Only my husband is working, but what he earns for a day is not enough to feed the three of us now. Tax cuts three years ago slashed government revenue by more than two billion dollars. The tourism industry was then damaged by the Easter bombings and the pandemic. Now there is no money to import fuel, medicine, cooking gas or food. Right now actually our main focuses are on food banks, on community kitchens and again long to medium term uh, community gardens and home gardens because we can give rations but it's very short term. The government is appealing for help. We urgently require the assistance of our friends in the international community to ensure that our immediate needs in terms of the importation of essential medicine, food supply and fuel are met. India and China have sent food and medicine in recent days. The opposition says the government has weakened the economy through populist policies and mismanagement. A nationwide campaign dubbed Gota Go Home has been running for two months, calling on the president to resign. The government is seeking a loan package from the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Critics say it'll take too long, even if agreed, and people need action now. Tens of thousands of Sri Lankans are going hungry amid the country's worst economic crisis in decades. Community kitchens like this 
can only feed a fraction of them. Minel Fernandez, Al Jazeera, Colombo. That uh, one of the guys from the NGO, he was saying that we cannot continue to give ration packs. We have to start giving people seeds to grow their own food in the backyard. Two years ago when COVID came, we started giving out seeds in Fiji. A lot of people made fun of us. A lot of media sort of, you know, made fun of it. But obviously it was in anticipation of all the things that would happen. We are lucky. You see, in Tunisia, they import about $198 million worth of wheat. Most of the North African countries in the Middle East and other parts, some countries, one or two countries in Asia, the only source of carbohydrate is wheat. They eat bread. People actually fight each other to buy the bread. Someone told me uh, two days ago in Savu Savu, or three days ago, four days ago, that in the USA, in some parts, the price of a loaf of bread is about eight US dollars. It's about 16 Fijian dollars. So the shortage of wheat has had a huge impact. Now, the, that's the only source of carbohydrate. We in Fiji have dalo, we have cassava, we have uto. We have those things. So, I mean, but uh, on Saturday I was at a meeting where cassava farmers complaining, he said, there's too much cassava and I'm not getting the right price. I've come to the Nasori market, in fact, he was from uh, Baulavi area. He said, I can't get the right price for it. But at least we have cassava. We're not running out of a carbohydrate. If tomorrow we can't eat bread in the morning, we can actually have cassava and dalo. There's something that's not imported, it's grown here. So, we, you know, you need to be able to put in place policy measures. So when we're doing this budget, obviously it's previous budgets too, these are some of the things we have to take into consideration. We have to anticipate what will happen. Some things are completely out of our control. On the other hand, our budget is not only about looking at for the next one year. We have to put in place policies about what's going to happen in five, ten years' time. Building capacity. So if we're going to, for example, you know, build a particular road to give people connectivity, it's not going to happen by next year, but it has to be done. So budgets are not only about the next few months or the next one year, it's also about what strategies you're putting in place for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Now, if you look at, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, inflation is everywhere. USA, the inflation is 8.5%. The euro area is 7.4%. United Kingdom is 9.1%. Japan is the lowest, is 1.2%. Australia is 5.1%. That's where we are sitting around about. And New Zealand is about 6.9%. So, you know, inflation is everywhere. All our trading partners have inflation. This is the World uh, Food Organization. And if you see, the, they normally they track. You can see this is from 2019 uh, to 2001. And they, they sort of track the, the, the price of food price index. They look at the cereals, you know, things, cereals like wheat and other things, corn, etc. Meat price, oil price, dairy price they're looking at. Over here, you can see the dairy price has gone up too. Uh, all of them gone up. Sugar has kind of remained relatively stable, which is a bit unfortunate for us because, you know, we could have got a higher price for sugar. But all of these things have actually gone up quite significantly. So, you saw in the revised budget, we uh, zero rated VAT on 21 items. Uh, previously, many years ago, they had uh, six items that were zero rated VAT. But obviously, it's not an extensive list. Many people actually, in fact, argued about what kind of prioritization was given. The thinking we had in the revised budget was that people don't only survive on flour and cooking oil. All of you need soap, you need washing powder, that's everyday items. You need toothpaste, women need sanitary pads, you need gas, you need kerosene. So if you look at the list of items, 21 items, they're very extensive. What is also very significant is this. Sugar, obviously, is made in Fiji. That's imported, wheat. Most of the rice you eat is imported. Canned fish, a lot of the canned fish you eat, mackerel, etc., is imported. All of cooking oil is imported. Potatoes are in imported. Onions are imported. Garlic is imported. Baby milk is imported. Powdered milk is imported. They only pack, bring it in bulk and have their own little packaging. Rewa, rewa you know, powdered milk and uh, uh, red cow or whatever. 
Liquid milk, most of it is imported. Dal imported, tea imported, salt imported, soap, a lot of it is imported. Some of uh, the in raw ingredients come from overseas, some make it here. Soap powder imported, toilet paper, some made locally. Sanitary pads all imported. Toothpaste, most of it is imported. Kerosene imported. Cooking gas is imported. So you can see from your basic items in your grocery basket, those things, most of it is imported. 90 to 95% of things that you buy are imported. So if one wants to be able to look at substitution, you can go for the more local things. But not everything can you buy locally, as we all know that. So a lot of people don't appreciate this, that because the way the economy has been managed during the COVID period, our dollar did not get devalued. A lot of countries, the dollar got devalued. If the dollar got devalued, and because we import so many things, you would have actually had to pay probably twice the amount now. Today, roughly, one Fijian dollar gives you 50 cents American. If the dollar got devalued, you probably have to pay $1.50 Fijian to get 50 cents US. If you're buying things from USA, it would have cost you more. Same thing with Japan, or Australia, New Zealand. But because of the macroeconomic stability, the dollar values remain stable. And also, uh, we've got a fiscal stability in the sense that we pumped in $500 million into what we call livelihood support, or employment support in Fiji. You know, the, um, if you go outside Nandi Airport, outside the airport where the bus shelter is, a lot of trees there near the railway line. A lot of people, in particular women, they sell a lot of food, lobo pack, roti parcel, boiled evi, mitai. They sell all that stuff, to, uh, and their customers are not the tourists. Their customers are the people who work at the airport. Their customers are the people who work at ATS. Customers are the people who work at Fiji Airways. So when the airport is shut down, Fiji Airways is not flying, ATS is no longer catering, the customers have gone too. Which means they're not earning an income also. That's why we had the one round of $90, two rounds of $50, two rounds of $360. As a result of that, we pumped $432 million into the economy through what we call unemployment benefits. All the market vendors here in Nasuri, they're not paying any market fees for this one whole year. Who's paying the market fees? We are paying the market fees on behalf of the market vendors to the municipal council. Municipal council needs money, doesn't, cannot do things in, you know, from thin air. So we pay the market fees. If you're a fisherman, you're applying for fishing license, we pay the fishing license fees. Taxi driver, your taxi license is expiring, we pay for the license renewal to LTA. Essentially to help people to be able to you know, meet some of those day-to-day -day costs in terms of their living. Go and get a birth certificate, it's free, because we know if you're going to apply for a job, you need a birth certificate. No, most employees require birth certificates. You don't have to actually pay for that also. So that's about $500 million that we gave in livelihood support. Now, you, uh, if you go to um, a private doctor, last year we started this program during COVID. We asked the private doctors to um, participate in a scheme where if, if normally a person who cannot afford to go and see a private doctor, if they went to a private doctor, we pay on their behalf. Instead of going to the health center or the hospital, you can, you can, you can go to the private doctor. Now, when we started this off, the College of General Practitioners wanted to say, we'll give one price only. We said, no. We want individual doctors to put in their expressions of interest. Because we know the one doctor here in Nasori used to charge $10 a visit. But as soon as government started to call expression interest, they started to say $25. So we said, no, we have to do it individually. Now in the second round, somebody's phone is ringing. Now in the second round, we are now can give, if you go and see a private doctor, If you go and see a private doctor now, that private doctor in Nasori can do your blood test for cholesterol, other, uh, other blood count, your blood count, kidney test, liver test, nebulizer if you're asthmatic. If they have an ECG machine, you've got some you know, chest ache, they can do the ECG. All of that government will pay. 
urine test, all of that will pay, be paid by government. And the reason why we've done that essentially is to a couple of reasons. One of them is that obviously we don't want people queuing up at the public health system. We know sometimes they have minor issues. They may have a small cut, they can go to the GP. During COVID, of course, we did not want a lot of people lining up in one place. I may have COVID, pass it on to somebody else if you're waiting in a small area. But now, it also means that if he goes and sees a doctor today, say, assume he's got a headache, the doctor will take his blood pressure and say, okay, look, you have a high rate of uh, you know, diabetes in Fiji, let me check your sugar now. Your sugar may be okay. You may give him some tablets, go and buy the tablets, and he goes off. Two months later when he goes, the doctor said, look, let me check your sugar now. He said, hey, last time you came, your sugar was four. Now it's gone up to seven. You're a young guy. Change your lifestyle, otherwise you can become diabetic. It helps monitor people's health more directly. You develop a relationship with the doctor. Now, a lot of times in Fiji, when people, have, when they go to the public health system, they can't be bothered waiting, etc. They may have a cut. It may be there for two months, it doesn't get better. You know how people put leaves and all that kind of thing? By the time it gets really bad, they go to the hospital, it's a time to chop off the toe. Your sugar level is very high. So this also helps in that way. So in Nasori now, we've got a lot more people who have actually signed up uh, for this particular program. Uh, there's quite a few people, but also in, uh, uh, you know, in Nakasi, Narere, etc. So like in Nasori, you've got a premium care medical center, PT Limited. Dr. Roman Chute, Losana, Burua, Nico Bakani, Manasa Bale uh, Nama, Namau. And then you've got, um, uh, you know, some other places in Nakasi. The one that's directly in Nasori is one, but uh, there's others in Nakasi and Nasinu. Please go to the government webpage and you'll, you'll find that. And you can go to these doctors and you don't have to pay a single cent. So that's part and parcel of what we're doing in terms of providing assistance to people. But it also helps us in the long term because we don't want people's toes and uh, knees and legs chopped off because of diabetes. Because you become less productive, you become more dependent on your family members, you become less productive in terms of getting employment. You have to pay disability allowance. If we can stop you from losing part of your bodies, then of course you become more productive members of, com of the community. ECAL has been removed. Departure tax has come down from 200 to $100. You no longer require a business license to start a business unless, of course, you're selling food, cooked food. Um, we had a soft loan, $200 million for working capital. We pay the interest rate for you for the first two years, and then you start doing your repayments in the third year. And as I mentioned, we zero-rated uh, VAT on those 21 items. A lot of people in Fiji now are talking about debt. You know, Salewun and Dinao, both Bhari Karza, but they don't understand about debt. Every country has a debt. A lot of the media organizations obviously are getting it wrong too. It's election year, so people politicize uh, the economy. If you look at countries like New Zealand, before the pandemic, the debt to GDP ratio is 20% only. Almost doubled. It's now 52% after the pandemic. Australia, same thing, 42 to 62. Malaysia, 56 to 71. Fiji went from 46 to 80. It's, about, it's sitting at about 79% at the moment. India, 70 to 91. Uh, St. Lucia is again a tourism-based country. That's a tourism country. Mauritius is a tourism-based country. So is Bahamas. You can look at the, look at the debt to GDP ratios increase quite significantly. The USA was already over 100%, now 133. Maldives jumped from 72% to 137%. Very large, it's, the entire economy is tourism-based. They get over a million tourists a, a year. I think about 1.5 million tourists a year. They get a lot of, apparently they've been hit very hard. They used to get a lot of Ukrainians, Russians for holidays, uh, a lot of Chinese, a lot of Europeans also go there generally uh, to Maldives and also to Mauritius. I know, I mean, Japan is already sitting at 233%. The interesting thing is nobody talks about these countries that are running into trouble. It's only Fiji apparently is in trouble. And the level of analysis is actually quite shallow and limited. It's one way of measuring debt, debt to GDP ratio. So if I can put it really simply, what is GDP? So if this gentleman has, say, $100, and he goes and borrows $20, you would say his debt to GDP ratio is 20%. Yeah. He has $500. And even though he'll borrow $50, which is two, times, two and a half times more than what he's borrowed, his, only, his debt to GDP ratio is only 10%. Even though dollar value is a lot more. 
but because he's got more money, he can borrow more money. As countries get bigger and get more money, they can borrow more money. When, we, when you look at debt, when you talk about debt, and when people talk to you about debt, there are two basic questions you must, uh, you must ask. What is the money being borrowed used for? Right. Why are you borrowing that money? Now, if we are going to go and borrow money, put it up in uh, Vuni New New Hill here, the Vuni Vivi, sorry, Vuni Vivi Hill, up here, and we say we'll build a $20 million facility so every time some minister comes along, he can stay there or she can stay there. That's what you call stupid use of debt because it's got no productive capacity. That's number one. So if you're going to, however, borrow money to connect people to electricity, to build roads, bridges, and jetties, to Tarsil Road, to build schools, to build hospitals, medical centers, that's increasing the productive capacity, providing services to members of the public. That's good reason for borrowing money. If you have a pandemic and you know that people, if you don't assist them, they will fall deeper into poverty. They won't have food on the table. Then get, that's good use of money. Because the alternative to not giving people two rounds of 360, or the two rounds of 50, or the one round of 90, and the $225 million we paid for those people in FNPF whose money had run out, which we'd also topped up, the alternative to that would have been these people would have had no money in their pocket. They would have actually gone into poverty. People would not have food not be able to pay their rent. That's good use of money. The second question you've got to ask is when you borrow money, what is the cost of the money? And the, when I say what is the cost of the money, it means what is the interest rate? What is the interest rate? So assuming the gentleman here, he wants to borrow $100,000 to start up a business. He goes to the bank and the bank says, no problem. Bread Bank says, I'll give you $100,000 15% interest rate, pay us back in three years' time. Same thing. He goes and borrows $100,000. He goes to H HFC. HFC says, no problem, $100,000. Pay us back in 30 years' time, 1% interest rate. If I look at both of them, both of them got, you can say, both of them got $100,000 debt. It's true. But there's a world of difference between the two. He is going to have high blood pressure. He has to pay the loan in three years' time, 15% interest rate. He has to make so much money every month to just meet his repayment. He's in relaxed mode. 1% interest rate, 30 years to pay, positive impact on his cash flow. Even if one day his sales are a bit down, he's okay. He's going to not sleep. He's going to do more sales. He has to do the repayment, otherwise they'll come and repossess his business. When you look at debt, you need to look at what is the cost of the debt. During this period, we have borrowed from the Japanese at 0.01%. 0.01%. 40 years to pay, 10-year grace period. The World Bank has lent to us at 0%. Service fee of 0.75%, 40 years to pay also. We've got different periods of debt. Some is 15, some is 20. The bulk of the money we borrowed is at those rates in, in, for that particular purpose. Now, in fact, the Japanese money we borrowed at 0.01%, if we paid over 40 years, by the time you actually pay the loan, you're only paying back 40% of what you borrowed. Because we've got a grant element to it. Most of you are old enough to know that you know, a few years ago, for five cents, you can, buy, you can get 10 Chinese loli. Now, one Chinese loli does not cost 20 cents. You can't even, for 20 cents, you can't even get one Chinese loli. Why? Because as time goes by, the value of the dollar will go down. People will say, oh, in my days, I could build a house only for $20,000. Now it costs $100,000. In the same way, we do a four-lane road now here. We build it now. The future generation don't have to build it. Plus, if they were to build it then, it would cost them a lot more. So when people talk about debt being passed on to the future generation, they need to understand if you increase the productive capacity, that's good debt to have now because they don't have to build it, plus it would cost them a lot more when they borrow in the future. The road has to be built. The other way of measuring debt, of course, is the dollar value. But before I get into that is, 
If you see our debt, to, even though the debt levels increased over here, went from 3.6 billion, 3.8 billion, 4, 4 billion, our debt to GDP ratio came down. Why? Because the economy grew. We became richer. That's why. That's seen on the roads. Ten years ago, you look at the number of cars on the road. Look at the number of cars on the road now. People don't go, buy, don't go and buy cars if they can't afford to buy it. Today, you know, in certain rural areas before, it was a big deal if somebody had a car. Now nearly everybody has a car. Some homes you have two or three cars. People, that means, have more disposable income available for them, for themselves. Let's look at the dollar value of the debt. You know, the actual dollar, like I said, 100,000, 100,000. The dollar value of the debt, these are what we call tourism-based uh, countries. Bahamas, the total debt is 11.4 billion. This is in US dollars. US dollars. Much smaller country than Fiji. Tourism-based country. 11.4 billion US dollars, which is about 22 billion Fijian dollars. Mauritius, 11.2 billion. Barbados, 6.6 .6 billion. Maldives, 6.3 billion. We are sitting at 3.7 billion US dollars, which is about 8 billion Fijian dollars. Right. And all these other tourism-based countries, you can see what, what, uh, what's the dollar value of their debt. It's not the value of the debt you should be concerned about, it's your ability to pay the debt is what you should be concerned about. It's the ability of how much cash flow you have. What's the productive capacity of the country? Let's look at some of the bigger countries. This is US dollars, but this is in trillion dollars, not billion, trillion. That's the next step up from billion. US debt is 30.5 trillion dollars. If you can get your head around that, that's about 60 trillion Fijian dollars. Japan is 13 trillion. US is the most debt ridden country in the world. Japan is 13 trillion dollars. China, United Kingdom, India, Australia is one trillion dollars, which is about one tri uh, two trillion Fijian dollars, and all these other countries. That's the level of debt that they have. So you can see that this is billion, this is trillion, completely differently. Nobody in Fiji says USA is in trouble. Nobody says Japan's got too much debt. Only apparently some, some people think only Fiji is in trouble. Now, I talked to you about foreign reserves. You need foreign reserves to buy things. As we mentioned, that the foreign reserves helps you to trade. The International Monetary Fund says you should have at least three months of foreign reserves to be able to trade. It's a good sign that you're afloat, you have money to pay things. Certain businesses in Fiji, when they now trade with some of the other Pacific Island countries, they want money up front. They want to say, pay us first, then we'll send you the flour. Pay us first, then we'll send you the tin fish. Because a lot of these countries have a problem paying in foreign currency. They don't have enough foreign currency. You see over here, we had 1.3 billion dollars in foreign currency, foreign reserve, 4.7 months worth of trading. Right. So this line here shows you how, much, how many months we can trade. We currently sit at 3 billion foreign reserves. We can trade for 8.4 months. Very good, comfortable space we are in. If you see over here, even though we had $2 billion, you could trade for 4.5 months. Why? Because when the economy is really moving fast, when you're building a lot of buildings, when you're constructing a lot of things, because most of the things in Fiji are imported, you need more foreign currency to be able to trade, to be able to buy things from offshore. When you have a lot of people buying cars, you need more Japanese yen. When you have a lot of construction going on. Remember, this is Winston here. After Winston, we spent $500 million in just rebuilding the place. $500 million. Schools alone cost us $200 million, over $200 million. Most of the schools in Fiji, of course, they're not owned by government. Only schools like ACS, RKS, QBS, Natambua, Lambasa College, they are owned by government. There's only about 10 schools like that. 
The rest of all the schools in Fiji are either completely 100% privately owned, like international school, or they're owned by faith-based organizations, like Methodist Church, Catholic Church, Sanatan Dharam, Muslim League, Seven Day, whatever it is. All those schools, even though they're privately owned by those companies, are privately owned by those organizations, when there is a cyclone, we have to build it. Those schools, those organizations don't have the money to build it. We have to build it. So therefore, it's the burden on government. When teachers' quarters get blown away of a cyclone, we have to build it. Roads, bridges, jetties. That's why we don't like climate change. Climate change is something that we cannot put our finger on in respect of we don't know in the yearly budget how much money to allocate. In the last cyclone season, we had only one cyclone, Cyclone Cody. But the amount it rained caused so much damage. If you travel between Singatoga and Nandi, there's a big hole in the highway in Kambisi. One lane gone in uh, Nawai, one lane gone in Semo. That's just on the Queen's Highway between Singatoga and uh, Nandi. In Bar and lots of other places, Irish crossings gone, landslides. So what happens is that, for example, if we have a program here, uh, maybe to Tasila Road, say in Baulevu. Right? Now, if there's a cyclone that comes up and we have to do urgent repairs so the highway can open, we'll stop that project because that's not urgent. Maybe in the program, but we'll take the money from there and urgently fix up this bridge or fix up the highway so people can have access to it. Or there's, for example, like in um, two cyclone seasons ago in uh, Northern Division, the power poles were put up three times, three cyclones. Went down, put it back up. Went down, put it back up. Went down, put it back up. So when we talk about building resilience, we love to get all the main electrical wires put underground so there's nothing to blow down. If you go to Nandi, from Nandi Airport all the way to Matintar, one thing that you see, there's nothing on top. Everything's underground. There's no wires on top. No telecom wires, no EFL wires, nothing. It costs us about $20 million more to put it underground. It costs a lot of money because the wires that go underground is a different specs. But you have to do that to build resilience. It's better to do it now than to try and come back and fix it up later. So those are the kind of things when you do the budgeting that we cannot obviously cater for, but you have to understand sometimes you said to people, we had certain, uh, you know, rural electrification projects. Because of pandemic, we had to put it in hold because for us it is more important to feed people, give the $500 million than to, for example, you know, cut a new road or, for example, do uh, uh, electrical works to provide people electricity. Now, liquidity, again, is something that a lot of people uh, just want to explain it very quickly unless you have more questions on that. Liquidity, essentially, is all about how much money is there in the banking system. How much money is in the banks for them to be able to lend? Remember, banks don't make money just because they got, banks don't feel happy if they've got lots of money sitting in their account. For them, that's not the mark of success. Banks make money from money. Remember that. Banks make money from lending money. So just because West Bank may say, I've got $3 billion in my account, that's not a good sign. They, they, Headquarters will say, what the hell are you doing with it? And there's dead money. So they say, how much money have you lent? Of course, they have to lend to people who pay them back. If they don't pay them back, there's bad debts, of course, and people disappear. But if they lend more money at good interest rates, that's how they make profit. They make profit from interest. So this lady wants to, if there's lots of money in the banking system now, if she goes and puts some money in term deposit, they'll give a very low interest rate. Because there's already a lot of money in the bank. Banks take term deposit from you, they may pay you 2% or 1%, then they take that same money and lend it to somebody for, lend it to her for 7%. That's how they make money. But they've already got more money, term deposit, interest rates will be lower. So, one of the things that we planned when the COVID came around, we said, hang on, we know that one day the economy will bounce back. It will open one day, no matter what happens. Of course, in the beginning, we did not know how many people will die. It will be elderly who will die first or the young ones will die first. The science was changing all the time. But as we got vaccination, etc. So when we borrowed more money from offshore, more money came into the system. 
as the economy now is opening up, a lot of businesses now want to borrow. Somebody pull an you know, extra warehouse, whatever. So for them to go and borrow, we have to make sure that the money they're going to borrow is cheap or cheaper. If you look over here, you can see when there was only $348 million in liquidity, the interest rate was 7.4%. Less money, high interest rate. More money, low interest rate, 5.6%. $2.1 billion in liquidity at the moment. Of course, we'd like this to come even lower. So you can see some banks actually to the top-end customers at the moment, I know in the commercial rates, they're lending at 4%. Some have lent at 3.8%. That's the impact of it. So, where to from here? As I mentioned, recovery of the tourism sector is critically important. We are not only dependent on tourism, even before the pandemic, we're starting to diversify our economy, but tourism is still a major component of our economy. And we have to look at different source markets. That's one of the things we were doing. Before, traditionally, we were very much dependent only on Australia and New Zealand. India is, was, before the pandemic, the largest outbound market in the world, or they're going to surpass China, at least, at the very least. But very few Indian tourists come to Fiji. What's our share of that? Even if we get 1% of them or half a percent of them, it will really boost up our numbers. I don't know now before, uh, after the pandemic, what the Indian appetite is for traveling. The Chinese also one of the highest outbound. We get a very small percentage of them to Fiji. Different destinations have different requirements. The Australians and Kiwis were the largest contributors. Australian was about 51% before the pandemic. Kiwis were about 16%. So between the two of them, they are approximately about 67% of our tourism arrivals in Fiji. So, what do they like? Sun, the sand, they bring the children here. We are very good with kids, our people. If you go to most of the hotels, they have what they call the kids club. They leave the kids with the nannies and they look after them all day. In two weeks time when they return home, they don't want to leave the nannies, they want them to go with them. That's how attached they become. So that's one of the source market for us. A lot of people to, uh, come to Fiji for weddings, get married in Fiji. Some people around Tavuni, they go there for diving. So you've got to have different experiences. Some tourists, they like to go to countries where they can do lots of shopping. We don't have that in Fiji. We don't have any brand names. You know, you can't go and buy a Gucci handbag or Louis Vuitton suit or something. We don't have that. But there's a lot of opportunity in the tourism sector. One of the things that we've been trying to say to people is, look, you can actually open a resort in the interior of Viti Levu. It's very nice places, nice waterfalls. It's a different experience altogether. Some people like that. So there's different ways to, you know, uh, make sure that our, our tourism market actually matures. And also in the conferences. This is the, the, what we call the downside, the Russia-Ukraine war. It'd be fantastic if it stops next week. Because then the wheat supply will be all freed up, the price of wheat will come down. The price of fuel will come down too, significantly. Let's hope it does not spread. Two weeks ago, we heard one of the Russian generals uh, saying that we should invade one of the other countries. I think it is Latvia or Lithuania, I can't remember, one of those L countries. Because they don't have uh, access to a, a place called Kalanigrad. So that's something that obviously is that out of our control. And as you said, also climate change. Um, we're focusing a lot on the private sector. We've reduced a lot of taxes. Uh, we've uh, brought a lot of digital technology. You know, all the amounts of money. Um, sorry, let me just, uh, if I just go over here. We paid $205 million to the people in the formal sector, you know, through FNPF. So if I was working in a hotel, I lost my job, I could go to my general account and withdraw money. Set amount every fortnight. If the money ran out, government paid you $225 a fortnight through your FNPF account. That amounted to $205 million. 68,864 people received that payment from government. You paid $205 million. Then the first round of $90. We said that this is $90 per household. But of course, some people chorrowed from the system. Five people from the same household, they all applied $90. We realized that very quickly. Then we said, okay, $50 per person. 
She jumped from 118,000 households to 224,000. So, you know, sometimes people may say, oh, it's only $50. But when you add everybody together, $50 for 224,000 people amounted to $11.2 million. $50 second round, 205,000 people, $10.2 million. First round, 360, we paid out $106 million. Second round, 360, we paid out $87 million. Altogether, if you add one level now, the $100, $432 million. Remember, all of this from round this one, round one, two, three, four, and five was only for Viti Levu. Viti Levu got hit the hardest. This one was for anybody in Fiji. If they have worked through, um, uh, they were uh, a member of FNPF, they got paid this out. If they were Savu Savu, Tavuni, Yasawa, Vanua Levu, they got that paid out. Now, in all of these payments, from here to here, nobody had to go to the DO's office, nobody had to go to the Ministry of Welfare or go to the Advisory Councillor or the Turangani Koro, nothing. You went to your phone. You went to your phone, you applied on your phone, you got paid on your phone. That was the beauty of this. In fact, other countries are now asking Fiji, how did you do it? So this man here is the main guy who did all the processing of this. In the back end. So that was one of the advantages uh, that we had. And I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that. Can you imagine? 241,347 Fijians having to go and line up outside the DO's office, Turangani Koro, Advisory Councillor, Ministry of Women, Children, Poverty Elevation, Provincial Council offices. Then people would have complained, long line, I've been here for the past five hours, I need water. In fact, you applied for this sitting in your home, sitting in your office, some people, or the bus stand. We could have paid this $106 million in one day, but we didn't. The reason why we didn't, because we knew if we paid it all one day, everybody would go to the DGCL and Vodafone office. Because people still like to see the cash. They don't want to pay through M-Pesa, you know, the M-Pesa payment system. In order to stop that from happening, we spread it over four or five days. So this lady will say, my neighbors got it, but I haven't got it. So she said, be patient, you'll get it. There's a lot of people who phone up about. Good. So, again, you know, the taxation system becomes simpler, as you know. You know, when we reduce the duty to zero, the VAT to zero percent, we still have to be responsible. We put up the VAT on certain items from nine to fifteen percent. So you're going to buy perfume, you're going to buy a camera, you're going to buy a stereo. Those things you have to pay 15% because we still need some money. When, we, when you stop paying VAT on those 21 items, government lost out $165 million. If you were paying 9% on that, we'd be collecting $165 million more. But of course, we said, no, we want people to pay less. These are everyday items. So those things have an impact. We need to have some revenue sources too. There are a lot of new things happening in the market too over here. As I said last year, we exported the highest amount in agriculture. The three highest products were kava, or yangona, ginger and turmeric, haldi. Big demand for it. Everybody sees haldi as superfood now. Things like seijan or moringa, that's now superfood. People in America want it. Those are the areas we need to develop. When we export more, we get more foreign currency also. There's some issues going around, of course, around the labor market. You would have seen in the newspapers some weeks back that the Australian recruiting agencies were looking for chefs in Fiji. If you're a chef with more than three years' experience, they're offering up to eighty to $120,000 Australian dollars. There's a shortage of chefs in Australia. You wouldn't think that. There's a shortage of teachers in some parts in Australia. A lot of teachers have gone. There's a shortage of accountants. I was told that 60 accountants have left Fiji. There's 
people don't do accounting services in Australia. In Melbourne, two and a half weeks ago, the waiting time at a public hospital was 24 hours. You went to a public hospital, you had to wait 24 hours. Why? There's a shortage of nurses. A few of them died in, uh, in, uh, in Victoria. So people don't want to take up the profession. If you read, there's an article uh, circulating two weeks ago. In New Zealand, they're short of about 60,000 people in the hospitality sector. In other words, there's not enough waiters and waitresses. You know, to open up restaurants, to open up hotels. A lot of people don't want to do their job. So what's going to happen as a result of that? It will mean they'll try and take our people. So we'll feel good. A lot of people say, oh, great, I'm going to Australia, three-year contract. Australia want people to do fruit picking, want people to walk in the abattoirs. People say, oh, that's great. Everywhere we go, people say, when can I go to Australia? They may go. What if all our chefs leave? What if a lot of our nurses leave? Who's going to be the, do the chef work in Fiji? We've also got a tourism sector. We'll be cooking for our tourists. If our nurses leave, do we have to keep on training more nurses? Every time they get some experience, they leave. The shortage of nurses in England, in UK, they're getting nurses from India. UAE has a shortage of nurses. We have a few nurses already in Al Ain, one of the Emirate uh, places in, in UAE. So there's a lot of movement. When there was a, um, when there was a Christchurch earthquake, they were rebuilding the entire city. They took a lot of our nurses, uh, sorry, took a lot of our carpenters and bricklayers and joiners. So they went on short-term contracts. A lot of them have now got permanent residency. We had a shortage of people. When we have a huge construction going on, we actually have a shortage of people to work in that sector. We now got construction companies bringing Bangladeshis to do the finishing off and all of that. We have a shortage of good people. So there's a lot of changes that are happening also globally as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the war, etc. So as government, we have to be mindful of that. We have to have policies around that. These are some of the you know, challenges. I mean, a lot of the politicians who are going around, they don't talk about this kind of sort of sophisticated approach and nuanced approach to the economy. But if you want to run the economy, you have to think about these things. As you know, the wage rate has... Uh, it's gone up to $4. Every quarter it will go up to reach $4 by January of next year. So that's, that's already in play. And uh, for the budget, we want to continue our investment in education. As you know that uh, even though we had the pandemic, we did not stop free education. Every child in Fiji from early childhood to year 13 gets free education. No more school fees. No textbooks. You don't have to buy textbooks, I should say. Bus fares are subsidized. Can anyone guess how much, what's our wages bill to all the civil servants? How much we pay are you on an annual basis? Can somebody guess? I'd like to have a quiz. On an annual basis, how much do we pay? All the civil servants, everybody combined. Sorry? Half a billion? 1.1 billion. That's our wages bill. The police, the doctors, the nurses, the teachers, all the civil servants. Everybody gets paid publicly. Advisory councillors, Thurangani Koros, everybody. Put it all together, $1.1 billion. How much money do we spend in a budget on an annual basis? About $3 billion. That's just wages, 1.1. Take one third out. Then the rest is operating cost, the fuel, the toilet paper, the maintenance of buildings, the rent. We pay over $25 million a year, if not more, just to rent places. You know, government offices, provincial councils, they build buildings, we rent it. Other private people, they build buildings, we rent it. Then, of course, we have to, what we have, have capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is the money we set aside to do rectification, tarsil roads, build bridges, drains, nursing centers, etc. So, our focus, of course, in the budget is all about climate change, also building resilience, providing equal opportunities. We now have, we're working with, uh, talking to FNU to ensure that we have enough courses available. We have short-term courses, you know, helping people to build uh, or know how to repair boats in the outer islands. All those basic type of skill sets, we're getting people to do certification in those areas. 
And that, of course, will continue to be the, the, the focus on the budget. Uh, this is the email address that you can send if you have any ideas, but you only have a few days to do so. You can go to this website. You'll find a lot of information available here. We published, for example, the, the, the state of the economy as we acquired under the law. You have that one? That the, 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 the. We also have the revised budget, as you can see. All of this information is available uh, on, our, uh, on our web page. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one other point I want to also highlight is about TELS. We spend $700 million a year on, ed on the education sector. Uh, that you know, includes, for example, payment of uh, school, uh, sorry, teachers' uh, salaries, uh, the maintenance of schools, the grant that we give to individual schools for free education. All of that is included in the $700 million, of which, of course, $156.5 million in TELS. Now, TELS, there, there are two types that we have in facilitate for university studies. One is that if you get toppers. Toppers is when you get a particular level of mark in a particular area of study. We don't have toppers for lawyers. There's too many lawyers. That's not a priority for us. We need nurses. We need engineers. We need more uh, doctors in certain times. We also pay for doctors who work for government once they become a doctor, we pay for them to get the postgraduate studies, to specialize at FNU. You know, like one year course, etc. We pay for that also. Um, but, you know, we need uh, marine scientists, we need surveyors, we need foresters. Those are the areas that we need lots of people. So if you get a toppers, we pay for everything. Accommodation, if you need accommodation, textbooks, university fees, everything. You don't pay us back a single cent. The only thing is that you have to work in Fiji for a particular period of time. So if I've done, if I'm a topper and I've done medicine, because medicine to do MBBS is quite expensive, you have to work in Fiji for eight years. You don't have to work for government. You can work for the private sector, you have to work in Fiji for eight years. Because we've invested in you. It's only fair. If you want to leave beforehand, you can leave, but you pay us back the money. If you work for four years, you pay back 50%. Right. We've had some people recently who've uh, uh, got a TELS and they want to go and work overseas. We said, that's fine, they can go, as long as they've got something to guarantee. It's not like, because in the beginning what happened, some people went away overseas and never came back. So they've lost that money. A lot of people don't understand. Today in Fiji, 70% of the population is below the age of 40. 65% of the population is below the age of 35. We have a young population. That means you're going to have more babies. It's a fact. It's a biological fact. When you have a young population, you'll get, they'll produce more children. So the question you have to ask is, what's the future of those children? If you're getting free education now, if you're getting toppers and tells now, they also have to get it. There are some people going around saying, we'll make university free. It's unsustainable. You run into hundreds of millions of dollars, so where will they get the money from? In the same way, we have to make sure that the younger generation is coming up, that we have a similar facility for them too. So TELS ensures that people are able to pay back the money that we've given them. However, if they pay back 50% within three years' time, we forgive the other 50%. And there's some announcements, obviously, uh, regarding that we can fine tune it. And if they, once they start paying the loan, if they're working, they only pay a small percentage out of the wages that gets deducted. So you can see over here that uh, we also, through the TVET courses, certificates 3, 4, and diploma level at FNU, we're offering that too. There's about 5,000 spots that we are paying for. There's a lot of people trying to take advantage of that. Whether it's you know, being, um, pastry, doing pastry, doing carpentry, doing joinery, doing plumbing, all of those skill sets we require too. We pay for that also. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, as I said, that's the information there. Please feel free to ask any questions. Um, if you have any comments, as I said, if you have any personal matters, please go to the people at the back. Uh, then we can talk about it. Because sometimes you're going to stand up and say, you know, my land lease has expired, all of that. I can't solve it now. We have to be able to give all the information to the people at the back. Or somebody may say, I've got a business license, got cancelled, we can't deal with it now. 
but we do deal with it. If you go to the back, give your phone contact details, etc., then we can come back to you. I would also uh, please ask you, I have to go to a funeral. I have to leave here at 12.15, so if you can finish by 12.15, uh, that would be great. Preferably even 12 o'clock. So you've got about, it's 11.15 now. You've got about 45 minutes, we can have an open session. Okay. Thank you. And please put up your hand. There's somebody going around with a mic. Thank you. Okay, I'm I'm Muhammad Jamal from uh, Andari Nasori. It's 40 kilometers away from uh, Nasori town. And uh, there's 15 to 20 uh, houses there without power. And I have been running through the whole of last year till today. Yeah. Yes, keep the old inside. The code Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very inspiring. I've got two questions for you. One, I've seen that uh, you were mentioning that the government now is spending about twenty-five thousand on rent. Um, I, have, I can see ITLTB representative here. There is a government uh, land uh, just below the bridge and I know that that land is currently uh, still valid at this point in time. Is there a team or is there a, a committee in the government that can look into such uh, government facilities that uh, their rent is still valid? just to decrease the rent issues that the government is currently paying. That's my first question. My second question, I'm a road user, and I can see from your presentation that the government is spending a lot of money uh, on road infrastructure. We know that the government of the day is currently paying uh, outsourcing um, the, um, the road maintenance. and. Uh, is there a way, currently before we used to have PWD, for the government of the day, can the government really look off the budget that has been used on road maintenance, and since it's still increasing, and uh, being a road user, we know that the road uh, facility now on the road is still uh, not at a standard. And we see almost every other day, that the, the people are still doing maintenance on the road. Can there be a way that the government can relook look into that so that we can decrease the budget on that? Thank you. Um, I think you misunderstood what I said about rental. What I said about rental was that we pay about $25 million, and I stand to be correct on the exact figures, about $25 million in renting office space, not land, office space. So, you know, so, so for example, in Suba, we have Suba Bow House. We have uh, Ro Lalambalabu House. Various other buildings, you know, Marela House. We have buildings over here that we're renting. So we actually uh, rent it from private uh, people or provincial councils. And that's the rent we're paying. I, I was not complaining about it. I was just merely highlighting the expenses, operational expenditure of government. So I, I could not understand your question. I didn't want to stop you. You said that there is a building there. What? But is it owned by is it owned by government? It's not. So who's using it now? The school is using. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the details of that. But, I mean, most certainly if it's, if it's a school there and it's a government building, government would have a good reason to give it as a school. I'm not complaining about the space. I'm not complaining about the rent. All I'm just saying, of course, as I've said before, before a lot of people used to rent 
offices to government, but the rent that was paid by government was too much because there was corruption. There's a building in Suba, in Samambula. It used to be a cinema before. Right? The rent they pay for that is over $200,000 a year. The deal was done about 20 years ago. They signed a 20-year lease. The building, because it was a cinema, did not have any windows. Only later on, they went and punched some windows at the back. Those are the kind of deals that were done, some of which we are left with, because there's a contract in, in place. That we don't want to do. We also, as we announced in Parliament, we're looking at moving, getting some new buildings, uh, and moving, moving some of those buildings out of Suva, into the uh, Nasinu uh, area, corridor. Because most of the people who actually live in the city, live, uh, work in the city, sorry, live around here. So they can go against the traffic. If I live in Valley Levu, there's a, I'm Minister of Education, I work in Minister of Education, now I travel the other way. We already identified people who are going to put up buildings. In most cases, like somebody put up a building, and it's not built for the, uh, for the ministry or particular government department, it's just a building. Then we have to come and adjust, you know, to our requirements. And we don't want that. We want buildings, if we're going to rent it, it needs, it needs to be built to our purpose. Yeah. And then you can pay rent. And that's why, unfortunately, as we've said before, some of the civil servants, the buildings that were rented by previous governments is not a good working environment for the civil servants. If you see some of the offices, they're very closed, no windows, nothing. So we're trying to change that. And a lot of these buildings, they're not green compliant. No, no, you can't say it's inclusive in this budget. That's my point I'm trying to make. You can't say, I'm going to build a $50 million building in this budget. Because you can't build a building in $50 million, I mean, in one year. You have to spread it. You have to call for tenders. But I'm saying you've got to have the philosophy, behi philosophy behind it and the policy mechanism. So when you call for tenders, so for example, you call for tenders for buildings or renting buildings, you need to say, it needs to be green compliant, it needs to have enough sunlight, you know, those kind of things. And we have budgetary allocations for those types of things. The second issue you raised about FRA, uh, you, I did not do any presentation. I did not do any presentation on FRA, so I do not know where you got that figure from. You said there's a lot of money in the, uh, given to FRA, so I don't know where you got that unless you were some preconceived ideas. Which one? I did not do any presentation whatsoever. It's all about inflation, about debt. Yeah I, would, yeah, I would beg to disagree with you that there's no improvement. Uh, we've now got a four-lane highway from Nasori to Suva. There are many parts of uh, Fiji that now has roads. The number of cars on the roads in Fiji and the size of those vehicles have increased tremendously. In fact, doubled in the past few years. If you see those big trucks driving around, if you see a lot of the roads that the way that were built previously, they weren't built to cater for the size and the loading of these kind of trucks, and the size of the vehicles, and the frequency with which you have these cars running. Now, if you go to certain parts of Fiji, the, the, uh, the maintenance is quite low than other parts of Fiji. Why? Geologically, it has an impact. If you travel around here, if you look at the soil, got a very clay soil, right? Certain parts of Fiji rains a lot more. So the way you build a road in a particular location would be different to say, for example, the way you build a road between, say, Tavu and Reki Reki. Very different. So with respect, there's a very simplistic approach. If you look at the amount of money that's been allocated to FRA in this budget, in the current budget, is, uh, is 13 million for operating grant. And then, of course, you've got uh, you know, roads, bridges, jetties, streetlights, 
So part of the stuff, for example, we got the, uh, it's uh, $325 million. $225 million for operating grant. And that's not only maintenance, new construction. I was in Vanuolevu last week. There are a lot of villages going up to Undu Point. They don't have a road. Forget a maintenance, they don't even have a road. That money there goes towards giving them a road also. We cut through trees, bushes, gullies, rivers to get these people access to road. These poor people don't have access to road. And to be frank, I questioned, I thought to myself, what was happening previously? How come there's about 10 villages here and they don't have a road? Now, if previously, if governments even build new roads about 50 kilometers even a year, today these people will be able to sell their fish and get a much higher price. They catch their fish there, they take the outboard mono to somewhere else, cost them 120 bucks to get the boat there, then from there they take a carrier to somewhere else, then they go somewhere else, by the time they come to Lambasa to sell their fish, it's 500 bucks, 400 bucks. So connectivity is very important. The quality of the highways are improving. If you go now, I don't know where you've been, which road you travel on. I mean, between Sue and Nasori Corridor, a lot of the small streets that were done by Housing Authority in those days, no standards imposed then. All roads were failing now. Now if you go to those roads, those roads are fixed up. I can take you to those roads. If you go to places in, in Fiji now, you've got footpaths. People actually have footpaths for school kids, etc. You know, Cunningham and all those, you know, what do we call, used to be low-cost housing areas. So, I mean, again, you, you can't say you're just simply going to cut it because roads need maintenance. Look at the road going from here all the way to Ra. Only in recent past it got all tassil. That stretch that was done by Naeem, the Malaysian company, through the treacherous stretch, which nobody was able to fix up. They had a couple companies before, you know where the waterfall is. That's all done now. It looks like New Zealand when you travel around there. So, I mean, I think you have to put it in perspective. When people look at the figure and they say, oh, you know, $300 million, you've got to look at what's actually happening with that money. This money also goes towards building jetties uh, in the outer islands. If you travel along King's Highway at the moment, there's about five bridges that are being fixed. The existing bridges could not handle the weight. This bridge we got uh, near the Suva Cemetery, that was actually given to us by way of a grant. Right? We got some funding. But a lot of these bridges will be coming from there. They have to be replaced. Unfortunately, we are now currently paying the price for substandard work being done in the past. If you go to the Western Division, if you go to the CSR bridges that was built 1920s and 30s, those bridges are still lasting. You can still take the weight. Bridges that were built after independence, after 20 years they're failing. After 30 years they're failing. You know those, those two, no it's not material, it's the construction and the corruption. If you look at the bridge near Suva Market and one in Vatuanga, they had to be replaced. And they went and did, we brought in experts. There's all concrete decay, not enough steel being put in. And as a result of which, you know, the trucks running on it day and night, the bridge started failing. So those are the kind of things you have to look at and put into perspective. I mean, the same thing with the, uh, I can tell you about water. The Water Authority of Fiji, of course, the amount of water rates we pay is, doesn't even meet the fluoride and chloride cost. Because, as you know now, of course, the cost of those things have all gone up. So we give a grant to the Water Authority of Fiji, uh, 248, let me just see. Have any of you traveled recently along, uh, you know, Weila? If you see all the roadworks that's going, the laying of pipes that's going on? Yeah. You go past Weila towards ACS, you see a lot of roadworks, uh, the laying of pipes. That's costing us nearly $300 million. We're getting a new water source from Viria. It will give us more than enough water to service everybody 24-7 with water supply. I've told the advisory councils, I met them a few months back. We now, certain hours you don't get water, other hours you get water. Why? We've got a lot of people now living in the Suva Nasori corridor. Leases weren't renewed in one level, 50% of sugarcane production went down. You have a lot of people from Lambasa living here now. Everybody wants water. The water pipes we're dealing with, 
were built 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Now we have to build more capacity. So we recognize that. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it was slightly delayed, but they've already out of the 25 kilometers of water pipes that had to be laid, they've already laid 17 kilometers. They're working day and night. So by May of next year, the Virea water supply will essentially solve all the water woes. And in fact, we'll be able to extend the water system even further beyond Nasori. It'll give 40 million liters of water, cubic million, uh, 40 cubic million liters of water, first stage. Second phase will be another 40 million liters. So, Water Authority Fiji, for example, um, gets $195 million uh, for, you know, doing water projects, etc. So that's, that's how it's done. Okay, thank you. Over here, please. The Honourable Minister, Ani Mbulvanagase. Firstly, uh, I introduce myself. I am Semi Sikama uh, of uh, Wunisei Tonga, Wunisei Village uh, in Tonga. Firstly, uh, please, uh, let me thank uh, the government of uh, the idea of uh, conducting uh, uh, the budget consultation, which uh, the government reaches out to the public so that we can. Uh, give our views and uh, maybe some recommendations on uh, matters of uh, development. You, sir, um, mentioned um, uh, uh, slightly just uh, on your uh, on your um, answer to the ladies' uh, queries about um, uh, the, the roads, which in fact uh, we really appreciate what the government has done uh, so far on road uh, development. Yes. Certainly. Uh, I have two points which are correlated to the place which I come from. In conjunction with uh, the development of the road from Nasionu to Nosori, there was a bridge that was supposed to be uh, done, to be constructed, that is across the Tonga Road. 2017, a budget uh, that came in. It I think it was $1.9 million to $2 million. And uh, the road uh, construction started. It went for three months when we saw the machines uh, pulled out one by one. They had, I think the FRA has conducted uh, the initial um, uh, land uh, negotiation with uh, the landowners and uh, the contractor started to work. The base is from the both sides of the river, Kornivia side and Tonga side, base already there. After four years now, after five years, yeah, there's nothing has been done so far. What we are facing is this. Maybe we can uh, put a suggestion on what we are facing. Uh, uh, every time we hire a taxi from our village, to the last village it cost eight dollars to go to. No, sorry, that's normal. But because of the road layout, we have to go all the way to Cornivia Road, which costs two dollars fifty more on me time. Meaning, for the last five years, we've been facing that. We have come up with some suggestions. I have already visited the FRA office, and uh, I put up some suggestions to them about the road layout, considering the safety 
the speed. I have suggested some ideas to them about putting a runabout in between Cornelia Road and uh, Rebris and Delcusa. And what I'm saying, I think the road layout right now, it does, n does not only affect our town community. The community comprises of three villages, one school, primary school. The farming community, when they come to Nosori, as I've stated, they have to take the long way, which costs more. An emergency on medical, they have to take that long road. So it's, when you reach Kornive Road, it is in the center of going to Nakasi or to Nosori. But we have to take the Nosori side because of uh, uh, the facilities that are available in Nosori. What I've suggested to them is this, sir. Why don't you put a runabout in between so that it caters also for the WV side? So that when they go to Suba, uh, they have to take just a, a shorter route than going all the way to Nusuri, um, uh, the Delcusa side. My concern on that is, oh, I have another suggestion to them. Why don't you upgrade? the current road put a roundabout there, but to me, putting a roundabout there which is close to the uh, Delcusa end of the uh, rail bridge may be a safety hazard because of the speed uh, limit which will stop or sudden a, a close um, uh, distance. I hope you have, uh, sir, uh, now uh, have a clear picture on the, on the concern, the first concern. The second one is looking at the road development in the country. Every road that is constructed, the maintenance cost comes in. Concede, we have to consider that, as you have stated, you know, last reply to the lady. What is, uh, what is the process, what is the process, sir, of a building a non-IFRA road, which uh, in this case maybe it's a non-cane access road, or it's a farm road? Who does the maintenance work? Is it considered? in your budget or every time the community comes and beg and ask whether it will be the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, the District um, Commissioner uh, for the upgrade. Is it a standard process on that or it will depend on who comes to ask? Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for that. The, just the, the first issue you raised, has that land issue been resolved? As I've stated, the land, resolved, the land issue has been resolved. The work has been started. There was a budget allocated for that. It was in 2017, 2018, 2019. The budget was $1.9 million, or maybe $2.2 million. Yes. If you, if you go back to the budget allocation at that time, it was allocated. The work has already started. Did they, you, you went to FRA. Did they tell you why they stopped it? Yes. Why they stopped is this. I was told. The contractor was given two jobs. One in our Tonga uh, bridge and the other one in Ba. He was given the two contracts. One way or the other, he didn't complete. I don't know what's the reason, but what's the process of giving contract and then all of a sudden it stops. Okay, I mean the contracts normally, they go through a tender process and of course there's non-performance, they can cancel the contract. And then there are penalties also uh, on the contractor. 
Um, so, but no, the, I, the only reason I wanted to find out about the land was that, you know, so no, I, can, the land, I can... I can the, land, the land issue was okay. If, if, uh, uh, the TLTB, if uh, someone uh, of the TLTB is available, because the work is already started. The machines were already there on site, mm. and they started work. Even the Cornivia Road Junction, Cornivia Junction, we have seen the, the road that leads to, to, the, to the site. Yes, on both ends. We were told by the TLTB, there was a, um, uh, a meeting by the TLTB stating that uh, the Nobuso um, uh, chiefs were consulted and also our, uh, our side, the landowners, uh, have already um, got it cleared from the TLTB. Yes. Do, do you guys know anything about that? About the road? Has it been transferred to FRA? Hasn't been. So what's what's stopping the uh, transfer? The transfer. Do you know? But uh, it, but has it been transferred? Do you know? Sorry? It still hasn't been transferred. Okay. If uh, the staff from the TLTB uh, states that if it is still for, for five years, for five years, and the work has already started with the base, the base from either both sides of the of the of the river, they have started. Uh, if, it uh, if it takes five years to consult. The FRA, the FRA has a different story on this. Uh, they said that the, the, uh, the land issue has been is settled, okay. so it's clear. No, the, the reason I'm asking is when we do talk to FRA, you. I want to know exactly what's happening. We've yeah. had in the past, for example, where we've done roads and there has not been transferred and somebody comes from the land owning unit and says stop no. it. No, I mean, no. we recently had a situation in one of the villages where we're building a seawall. Yeah. We started the seawall. And then one half of the group came and said, we don't want the seawall. We want to build a different style seawall. So then we had to stop. So we then had to go and have a meeting with everybody. And then we got a resolution. And now everybody's agreed. Then we recommence the building of the seawall. So I, I, I'll find out. Please, sir, because yes, uh, for us, uh, this is something that we really appreciate. We've been looking forward to that. Yep. The community, we were told by the FRA in every in Tikina that um, the road... Uh, um, work is cleared. I, I'm asking the TLTB. Is that is that the correct answer from uh, the the manager, or is it from you too? I'm sorry to ask this because uh, I'm I'm trying to get uh, consultations uh, um, uh, with the budget so that it's cleared. Uh, I, I mean, look, you you raised it. Let's not put them on the spot. You, no. you raised it. Uh, we can find out from FRA please, what, what, what the real yeah. issues. What, 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 what really cost us now is the delay will cost us every time we get a taxi. It costs us two dollars fifty more. Sure, two dollars fifty more. Uh, the the second issue you raised, sorry, was the or oh, the road. Uh, no, the the farm roads. The farm roads, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the FRA budget, uh, as the lady would uh, who may be interested in this. The FRA budget essentially is for FRA roads. There are lots of other roads in Fiji that people use it as roads, yes. but they are what we call farm roads. Farm roads, yes. They are what we call sugarcane roads. So the allocation for those, that funding goes to the respective ministries. Sorry, sir? R goes to the respective ministries. Okay. So agriculture has a budget for farm roads. Uh, Ministry of Sugar slash FSC has an allocation for sugarcane roads. Um, they're the two major ones that, that have the, the funding. You would have heard us in the revised budget, mm -hmm. because of the huge weather changes, FRA was given an additional $5 million to do non-FRA roads. Those non-FRA roads, some FRA roads, I mean, uh, in, in around here, but also in the west, they use more like a FRA road. Even though the ownership has not been given to FRA, yes. they still own privately, but buses still run there. Yeah. People still use it as a, you know, as a public road. So we've said in those non-FRA roads, we've given some additional funding. 
we can't continue to do that, but some of them had some emergency work that needed to be done. Okay. Now, if we were to do all the roads in Fiji, <laughs> This budget yeah, is going to be yeah. all over the place, yeah. right? Which we can't. Um, and you know, uh, legally speaking, of course, we have to ensure that. I mean, we've got some people who say, "I want a farm road built right in there," and then they'll say, "Well, you know, well, how much are you producing?" They may be doing only one acre of ginger, but then there are some people who are doing 25 acres. They need a farm access road. So, in terms of priority. Obviously, agriculture will give them more priority, more production, etc. You know, as, and as we said, as the economy, as the economy grows bigger, yeah. then you build capacity within the economy to be able to facilitate more such development. Yes, very, very true, sir. Um, what I'm concerned is, uh, once you build a road, there, are, there were feasibility studies conducted, there were surveys conducted with the community and the income that is generated from that community, they build the road, but they should also consider maintenance work. So in every budget, uh, annual budget, mini budget of your ministry, sir, uh, as you have stated, the fund is given to um, uh, ministries. Um, do they consider about this? There are ideas which I come up with. Okay, uh, they look at the road, they know, okay, it is now time for maintenance. They do it early, and they can work with the community. Okay. Now, we I, provide... I, I need to bring it to an end, because you and I are having a private conversation now. There are lots of other people. Okay. Um, but to cut the long story short, no, there is no maintenance, but I think the community also has a responsibility. Very true. We have done places where we've done sugarcane roads. The farmers come and plant right up to the road. Right, right up to the road. And they'll put the soil, you know, the farmland is higher than the road. So the road becomes a river when it rains. They don't clean the drains. If they're, cutting, if they're growing sugarcane here or they're growing the dalo, at least they can cut the grass for the drain. Yes, these are private roads. The particular level of responsibility is there too. Very okay, true. but when we'll talk later. So yeah. you, anybody? Uh, else? You? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, before that, sir, thank you so much. Sir. No, no problem. I'll come to your office and uh, discuss this. Sure, further. don't come before the budget. No, no, no. <laughs> after the very budget. busy. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, please. So we have a revised budget which uh, allocate uh, for restaurants is for 15% VAT. When we talk about restaurants, most of the 21 items that is over there, most of the items we purchase, we cannot claim VAT. But on our sales, we have to pay 15%. What do you mean you cannot claim back? Uh, like uh, rice and uh, oils and all those when we buy, we don't have to pay VAT because those items are VAT free. Yes. So on our sales, we have to pay 15% VAT. Right. For example, when we run our shop in a uh, restaurant in uh, town, uh, uh, like juice and all those comes in, we can only play, uh, claim 9% VAT. And on the sales, we have to give 15% VAT. So if we increase the price, of our juice and all those by 6%, which we are losing at the moment. So what the customer will go if uh, a can is sold at 230 in my shop, so they will say, oh, 10 cents more over here. So I better go to the supermarket and buy it there. So before, our, we have to maintain the price. So, so sorry, but so they bring the can of Coke inside the restaurant? Uh, if we sell a can of Coke in our restaurant... No, but do you allow people to bring drinks from outside? No, no, they won't bring it out, but end of the day we are losing sale of that particular soft drinks and plus the snacks they're going to be buying or something like that. So end of the day when 9% uh, bet was on restaurants, we were able to uh, claim 9% and we were able to, on our sales, we were able to pay. Now we, it, it is 15%, an increase of 6%, and uh, most of the 80% of the items that comes in the restaurant, which is bed free, so obviously our uh, payable amount is more. So if we are requesting in next budget, if looking at the size of income of the restaurants, and we allocate according to that the wet amount. If, for example, if I... Uh, 
I'm a wait registered because I'm a fourth above 100,000K. So I have to be registered on. But uh, my income is less than 200K. So mm. looking at the staff that I got and plus increase of 6% wet and the amount that I'm not, I'm not able to claim, which is uh, in difficult to SME business to run at the moment. Compared well, not, to not, not all SMEs, but maybe a, uh, you're saying for restaurants. Can I suggest very quickly you send an email on that submission of yours? I okay. did. Uh, I already stole, you already okay, uh, good. I, I already written an email okay. to them and uh, I have uh, mentioned my company name and also if they want uh, more questions to be answered from their side, I have uh, done it. And also I have uh, talked to FRCS uh, regarding uh, allocating of uh, wet portion to the income. So they said they're going to be discussing with uh, the government of the day and uh, they will decide and let us know. Yes. Okay, thank you. Over here, please. Over here and the gentleman there. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Uh, looking at the budget consultations, uh, for the benefits we was given to the unemployment, I've seen that, that the government has been sent, uh, spent so much of it, it's millions and millions of dollars. My question, can the government pump more money to the Ministry of Ag Agriculture. Like, uh, during the pandemic, sir, the border was closed. The tourists, uh, they did not come to our shore. So people were laid off working in the hotels. The FAC, sugar, even the gold mines were closed, even the supermarket. The only ministry in the government that we know that it was running uh, during the pandemic time was the Ministry of Agriculture. The reason why I'm standing up, sir, the money that was given, I believe, I think it's five times. And uh, the government is spending millions and millions of dollars. Uh, can the government spend uh, more money on uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and try to enlighten the minds of the farmers or the peoples of Fiji by giving the money, the beneficiary, for the unemployment? Does it do good to the government? What, what in return? My point, sir, uh, like uh, we as a farmer, we are lining up in the common uh, machinery like the digger because we can afford it. It costs us $28 an hour if the digger is used. But if we go uh, to the private uh, and we try to hire the digger because the fuel price is going up, it will cost me about $95 uh, an hour. So I, I can't afford in this point of time. So my, um, can the government sir, help us uh, to purchase more digger? And uh, which is the one that we can afford at this point of time to help us, uh, like we are trying to utilize more land, but we don't have the capital to work. For $28, sir, I believe that we can afford. For $95, it's, it's quite difficult this time. So I asked the government, is it possible? Because the only ministry that was up running during those days, the government even advised people go back and utilize the land. Uh, until now, sir, I believe uh, uh, the government did not get any return if we just keep on giving money to the beneficiaries because they just go spend the money. Rather, if the government uses it to the agriculture so people can afford, then we, we go and plant and that we bring more products. Maybe we can help the government. Uh, even myself, sir, that we are trying to fight poverty in our country. And I believe the best thing that we can do is just pump more money to the Minister of Agriculture, enlighten the, uh, the minds of the farmers or the people of Fiji, and maybe we can just go back and utilize the land. Because I know the Ministry of Agriculture was the only ag uh, ministry was up running during that time. Everything was closed down, but everybody able to survive, keep them flow during those days. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, so apart from agriculture, with the uh, proposed increased budget, you're saying for the allocation of machinery. Any, any other area you think they should spend money on, apart from facilitating for machinery? Yes. Okay. Okay. So 
No, th thank you for that. I mean, there's that, something that we obviously have been thinking about also in respect of access to machinery. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Even before the fuel price increase, uh, if you go and uh, hire government machinery, it's $28 an hour. If you go to the private sector, it's about $90, even $100, depending where it is. Of course, now with the fuel price increase, it can get even more. That's something that we are obviously looking at what's the best way to deal with it. Um, and also when you have, you know, uh, the other thing is that when you have government machinery, which you can go and hire $28, it's a limited number of machinery. Right? So is it maybe one tractor for Loma Ivuna, for example, or one digger. But that's not enough. You may have lots of farmers. And, you know, the preparation time for the land, for example, for ginger is quite short. So you need to get that done really quickly. So how can you get more machinery out there? And uh, the other point also, sometimes we've got complaints where, you know, like up Singatoga Valley, there's a government tractor there or, you know, uh, some other machinery. If the driver is sick for the day, then it doesn't work, right? The machine is there, but it's not working. Or, for example, if some tractor in a remote place, some part breaks down or, you know, goes bad, and it takes two, three weeks to fix it up. So those are some of the challenges, obviously, we're currently looking at and what we can do to make it easier for the farmers because... I mean, you're absolutely right. Minister for Health and Permanent Secretary for Health would, would argue and say they were also up and running during the COVID. Uh, but, but my point being that uh, you're right, I mean, agriculture is the way forward. A couple of things you have to be mindful of is that, I, I don't know if you hear earlier on, I was mentioned in the, in the introduction. I was at a meeting on Saturday night um, and somebody was complaining that the, he does not get enough money for the price of cassava. Too many people growing cassava now in certain areas. So we also have to be, as a farmer, you need to be, it's a business. At the end of the day, it's a business. You're not running a charity, right? So you have to make sure that you have some smart business decisions too, that you're growing the right crop. Um, and you're not sort of flooding the market because your price will come down. Somebody said to us about a week ago, they said, oh, you know, um, uh, my, the price that I'm getting for my cassava or some other product, he said is very low. So I want AMA to buy it all. So I said, okay, if AMA buys it at a higher price, what will AMA do with it? He said, I don't care, throw it away. But I want the money. You know what I mean? So, so we have to be, you know, we have to be mindful. When we, we started giving seedlings, as you know, to, you know, a backyard garden for people to grow their own vegetables in their yards and all of that, the farmers also got a lot of seedlings too. A lot of farmers are giving seedlings. No, 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 but I'm saying just the, you talked about getting people used to the idea of culture, of farming. So it, it starts there. You see, because I remember, as a, even when I was in school, if, if somebody does not, did not do well in school, the teacher would say, what, you want to become a farmer? You know what I mean? The whole attitude was wrong towards the farmer. Farmer was a profession that was looked down upon. You know, if you could not do anything, just go and become a farmer. You do some tay tay, people did not think commercially. The other issue with the reason why agriculture sector in Fiji did not grow for years was because the laws prohibited uh, leases for, uh, for more than 30 years for agriculture. Right, so if you went and lease some land tomorrow, Itauke land or even government land, I'm talking about previously, the state nor the TLTB would give you land for more than 30 years for agriculture. But for tourism, residential, commercial, industrial, you get 99 years. That's why in Fiji you never saw large-scale commercial farming. Because if you've got a 99-year lease, agriculture lease tomorrow, you say you've got 50 acres, you can actually go to a mainstream commercial bank and they will lend you money. You want to buy your own excavator, your own tractor? Because they can use the land as security. You get a 30-year lease, nobody's going to touch you. Or 20-year lease, or 15-year lease. So the laws now changed. So TLTB can give Nine, up to 99 years for agriculture lease. I know some of the TLTB guys don't want to, but need to think commercially also. 99 year lease commercial, uh, for agriculture purposes is good because a lot of people can do commercial farming. That's one reason, issue. I think, and that's a very critical issue uh, because that way then, we, you know, people get more surety in respect of that. But I, but I hear what you say, and that's something, in fact, we've been having discussions around that at the moment. We've asked agriculture for some also some details so we want to know exactly, for example, in the Tailevu area, right, how many farms are there, say, for example, dealing ginger, whatever type of crops they have. How many of those farms need access to machinery? Some may not. Some may do. 
What type of machinery? Is it excavators? Is it tractor? Is it, uh, you know, the diggers or whatever it is? Those graders? We, we're trying to get all the information from them. Once we get the information, then we can better plan for the budget to say, okay, this is the kind of allocation we can make. And even if we get the private sector, right? If we get the private sector, for example, and we may have to fork out some more money, we can say to the private sector, we want to look after all these 100 farms. But all of them require tractor service. We don't want downtime. You must be up and running all the time. And then you may still pay us $28, but we may be paying them $100. So you subsidize. We may need to pay the balance. Do you know what I mean? The same way with sugarcane farmers. Sugarcane farmers, the bag of fertilizer before the pandemic was $45.65. The sugarcane farmer pays $20, we pay $25.65. Now the same bag of fertilizer is going up to $80. They're still paying $20, we're paying $60. You know what I mean? So that's, that's something that we're looking at because we, we also recognize if in the next couple of years we can build a lot of capacity in the farming sector, uh, then you know, it will create a culture of uh, farmers. Yes and no, because there's a lot of private uh, importers too, uh, exporters from Fiji, as you know. Dalok Sawa, you've got Ben trading and all these guys, they'll come and buy. So the pricing is very, very important. I was talking to a lady last week in Sabu Sabu. She said that before the, you know how Australia has now lifted up the ban on uh, Yangona? Now you can take more. She said she used to sell in Melbourne $320 a kilo for Yangona. She used to take it from me, I said $320 a kilo. Now because Australia lifted up the ban, we've got that arrangement, she's now selling for $40 a kilo. A lot of people are bringing it in, in the market. You know what I mean? So these kind of, a lot of these biosecurity things, the arrangements we have can change the dynamics of the price. AMA is 100% government funded. So that when they go and buy somebody's Dalo, Kasava, Daruka, whatever it is, that's actually taxpayers' money buying it. So if you're going to use taxpayers' money to buy the Kasava and then throw it in the river because nobody else wants it, that's a waste of money too. So you know, there's a lot of things at play. Uh, we've got somebody at the moment that agriculture is working with to set up a flour mill to make flour from cassava. And if that happens, they'll be great. You know, you can learn, there's a lot of export opportunities for that. A lot more people want to buy flour, cassava flour. Some restaurants will use it, you know, to coat the fish, all those kind of things. If you, if you make bread from cassava flour, 100% cassava flour, you can bounce the bread. It'll be hard. But if you can, they, they're doing some studies. If you can mix normal flour with maybe 20% cassava flour, you'll get the right texture of the bread. So those are the kind of things that's been worked out. But I, I agree with you regarding the machine, and we, we certainly are looking at that. That's what I was saying. So you need the machinery at the right time. Yeah. So. I mean, we were in Loma Ibuna some weeks back where we launched a product with FDB, where now farmers can get up to $50,000 through FDB. But the deal is that whoever is buying the ginger, they do the payment to FDB, FDB takes out their portion, the repayment, and then they pay the farmers, right? So that's, they've all agreed to that. But over there, um, they were asking for some graders or the diggers, and the agriculture guy said, well, it's at the moment in Dolai Suva. Once it finishes there, then it'll come here. So sometimes the timing can go off. So that's, we, we recognize that issue. Okay. Over here, please. Oh, oh no, over here. The gentleman in the red, red shirt. Ah, below. You can speak in any language. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank the government of the government. And I want to thank the government of the government. And we have all the water here. And my name is Pardeep Singh. I am talking about the Millium Subdivision. I am talking about the Millium Subdivision. There is a drainage problem there. There is a problem with the road. There is a problem with the water. Because the road is on the road. There is a road on the road. There is a road on the road. There is a road on the road. There are 40 or 45 houses. There is a road on the road. There is a road on the road. There is a road. और इसके बारे में वक्त के मध्य नजर रखते हुए 
as they say. Abdin Dakwa ni problem. Millennium development. He's talking about millennium development. The road, the water access is very bad. The uh, water pipes are right down in the main road. And then you've got those individual small pipes that go all the way to the homes. So it always breaks. His cars go wrong and blah, blah, Right? I'm just talking about it. Kuch aur raha, uske alawa? I'm just talking about it. No, no, no. Sure, sure. No, we don't want to go. We don't want to go to the mud. Yeah. आप कल अपन वहाँ नंबर लिखवाए देना पीछे। अच्छा, अच्छा, अच्छा। बर कल अपन फोन नंबर दे देना वहाँ पीछे प्लीज। इट इट इस जनरल इस नंबर डाउन फॉर मिलनीम डिपार्टमेंट। प्लीज माइक ओवर हियर। Two questions. Before I ask my questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, this initiative of uh, coming around uh, and uh, give a brief that uh, has never been done before. Uh, we are glad that uh, I know many times we used to run to radios to listen to Mr. Charles Tinson and William Bombo to deliver the budget. But uh, through this way, we now know that uh, uh, the financial standing of a government as it is before even the, the budget uh, presentations uh, in parliament. And we thank you for, for the initiatives and the staff uh, who have uh, uh, prepared uh, this uh, uh, in, uh, very informative uh, presentations. And we now know that uh, uh, despite some lies, that uh, were going through uh, during the pandemic that uh, we have no money. And uh, now, through these presentations, we are glad that uh, those are just liars trying to uh, undermine the work that has been uh, an efforts of the Fiji First Government. Even now we know that the U.S. has a lot of debts to look after China, Australia and New Zealand and all the countries and we thank you for that. My question is um, during the, the lockdown uh, I have a transport service uh, business which I took some loan from some of these uh, lenders. Uh, one uh, a vehicle was running in Kandavu to look after our people there and transporting their goods and supplies to the ports and also the, there was also another one in Suva that we are always uh, hire it to Water Authority, uh, Wildlife and NGOs. And because of the eight months lockdown, there was no income. And prior to the other... That's, uh, your, that's, your, that's your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've lost out my vehicles. Uh, the question is if I can get assistance. Uh, to get my business back on time, uh, back on track. Uh, the second question is, if we can uh, have this uh, after care fund uh, increase a little bit, uh, because uh, some of these uh, after care fund recipients, when they go after Winston Hurricane, they go out and seek some housing assistance. What? They are told is that no, you are not entitled here because you receive after a care fund. Only those people who receive um, family assistance and uh, other allowance from the social fair, they are the ones who can come to us. So they stop there. So if there is uh, can be a flexibility on the policy in case uh, hurricane strikes again, they can go to and have some uh, repairs on the house and things like that for the aftercare fund recipients. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, that's strange because I know when we had the uh, uh, home care and all of that, everybody was entitled to it, even though they worked or were in pension, they all got it. Uh, but look, uh, we've had submissions on the aftercare fund increment. We've had that submission. Uh, the other point I want to make very quickly is that 
the other person issue, please leave the details to them so we can see what, what can be done, if anything can be done. Uh, we've also published, you can go to the website, this is called the uh, Pre-Election Economic and Fiscal Update. So it tells you, you know how you're saying all the information, it's all available here. It tells you where the debt is, gives more, more detail exactly, the revenue and income, etc. We're required now to publish this under the law. Uh, so all that information is available there. Uh, it tells you, uh, you know, for example, the, uh, the, the, the interesting, the activities on payments, the personnel payments, etc. All of that is here. You can get all the information. Um, so any other last question, please? What we here? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Just like to comment on uh, two things. One is uh, the side road that has always been talked about in Lambasa, the bypass road. I think uh, there should be some allocation done and work should progress on that. Uh, starting from Korea, uh, it's not Kornivia, it's uh, Koruviri. Koruviri into Siberia and then going in so that we can have Lambasa town, a much cleaner place. That's one. Second one is that uh, the Suvanasori corridor is the most busiest uh, road we have. And I think we have about a thousand vehicles coming in on the road every month. Looking at that, what are our plans for having another road or a uh, way in which we can tackle this uh, vehicle or the traffic issue? And uh, the other suggestion I have is that we have uh, the industry, the beef industry, goat and the sheep industry. If that can be worked out with the 14 provincial councils, we should be able to make a lot of breakthrough in that that they have a target to achieve, and they could at least uh, invest in the young uh, students of their areas to go out to agriculture department, study, come back, and then take up the responsibility of having a company organized for their own provincial council. And I think that's the way forward, because they have the land and the facility, and I think we'll be able to stop a lot of uh, leakages out of this country. Thank you, sir. Um, the bypass road has been, uh, you know, talked about. Yes, uh, we have to talk to FRA on that. But government obviously has announced a few years ago your policy in doing a bypass road to Lambasa Town. Yeah, I mean, it, look, I mean, in, it's not as easy as saying let's get the provincial council to have their own business. You know, one of the challenges, of course, in, in farming, as I said, we have a bit of a reputational issue with farming. The average age, for, I'll use an example, of a cane farmer in Fiji today is 59 years old. If you go to high school today, you ask them, how many of you want to become a farmer? How many of the young people say they want to become a farmer? I would venture to say most of them would say no. Right. So it's also like this gentleman said, you need to create that culture around farming. You need to make it attractive. You need to make it, you know, for young people, sexy to be a farmer. There's a lot of money involved in also farming. There's good money. If you're a good farmer, a lot of people make good money. It's also cash money. So people need to understand that. This is one of the reasons why, for example, a lot of rural areas, we try and put street lights. It's not for fun we're doing it. We put street lights, we're trying to get internet connectivity. We're in Vanua Levu, we connected about 40 places with internet. Because we want to make the rural areas also attractive for people. Nowadays, young people, they want this thing, this thing here. We have over 600,000 Facebook accounts, authentic Facebook accounts. When you have 70% of the population below the age of 40, there's a lot of young people using this. If you say to them, you go and do farming in that area, there's no electricity, there's no internet connectivity, they won't want to stay there. So this is why we put street lights, it's for safety, etc. We allow people to sell their goods at night. You travel along Queen's Road, I, you know, Queen's Road, King's Road, People are selling, they're doing the hot sila at night time, you stop, you feel safe, they feel good, you're buying the sila, you're creating economic activity. Shops stay open longer, so we need, we're connecting people, more places are getting internet connectivity, we identified 300 places in Fiji where what we call black spots or brownouts. Black spots are where there's absolutely no connectivity, brownouts are where you climb the coconut tree, hang by one leg, and then you get connection. Right, so we have to fund these things. To cost one tower will cost half a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. If there's a village of twenty people in that village, they don't have connectivity. Even if they spend ten dollars a month with twenty people, that's only two hundred dollars a month. The tower costs five uh, five hundred thousand dollars. The mobile phone company is saying we're not going to go there. So we're charging them a levy. Money goes to trust account. Government will get funding from the budget.
budget and then we connect them with internet, connect them with mobile phone connect. So there's a lot of dynamics at play, you know. And of course, you know, you, people need to have the know-how, you know, in terms of like, for example, animal rearing. Not many people know about animal rearing, cutting the hooves, doing all that, you know, that needs to be a lot of training. It's not going to solve it overnight. It needs to build capacity. Again, I go back to the gentleman who's made a very valid point about building that culture of agriculture. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no other question. Thank you very much. I really have to catch a flight to go to Nandi. Somebody passed away last night. I have to go to a funeral, which is at 2 o'clock. Uh, and thus, um, I have to, sorry, I have to cut it a bit short. But look, thank you very much for coming. As I said, uh, the, the web page is there. If you have any ideas, you want to give any more details, uh, please go to that. Uh, and you can uh, give us your last minute ideas. Please give your phone contact to the people at on Millennium. If there is an issue we need to solve. Thank you very much and have a good day. Vinaka, thank you.